Dirty little secrets the food industry doesn't want you to know. Meet a renegade whistleblower who says the food you eat is a science experiment. And you're the guinea pig. Plus two women, one 600 pounds, the other just 80, pushing relationships with food to the extreme. The life-saving intervention. I, I want to help you. I'm asking you if you'll do this together. Coming up next on Dr. Oz. Today, a food industry whistleblower comes clean. He's here to warn you about the most worrisome threats to your food. And his message, simple. The food you are putting on your family's plate is being made in a science lab. And you are the guinea pigs. His name, Bruce Bradley. Bruce Bradley knows firsthand all the food industry's dirty little secrets. In fact, he helped hide them from you when he worked for some of the world's largest food companies. From deceptive labeling and cheap ingredients to misleading advertising, Bradley is now exposing the tricks and traps the food industry has been using to dupe you. Bradley claims big food companies are not concerned about the health of the consumer, but instead are driven by their bottom line. His insider account of what really goes on is laid out in his book, Fat Profits, a fictionalized account about big food's greed and corruption. Bruce Bradley believes the policies of the American food industry have left you in the dark and not in control of what you put on your family's plate. Bruce says he sees some disturbing trends in the food industry over the past 20 years. So what have you found to be most deceptive? I think one of the most troubling things is that food companies like to pretend like they're your partner, like they're your friend in healthy eating. And the truth is anything but. Um, Food companies are great at looking at trends and trend spotting out there. And what they do is they just you know, tweak their products and make them look healthier. Uh, they create misleading, ad misleading ads or deceptive labels. And they use a tremendous amount of uh, lobbying efforts to get their way because it really is all about profits. They're looking to make more money. So Bruce is going to take us through the secrets the food industry is using to deceive you. The first secret has to do with sweeteners. Now, all of you guys are waking up and wising up to the health effects of sugar. Yet the food industry depends on it. We know that because it's so addictive to us, so you can buy more of their foods. So how's the food industry reacting to this public pressure on reducing sugar content? Well, they're scared. I mean, they're watching these trends and they're honestly scared because sweeteners are one of the ways you make sort of tasteless ingredients pop and the way you get people coming back to buy more and more, uh, more, and more food. So they're running scared and they want to find new uh, ingredients that they can use to substitute out sugar. So you say they've been on the hunt for this silver bullet, something they could really use to, to spice up their sugar, so to speak, to replace the amount of sugar they're putting in their food. And it's something mm -hmm. called sweet mix. Mm -hmm. What is sweet mix? Sweet mix is something a little bit different. Um, rather than some of the artificial sweeteners or so-called natural sweeteners that they've been uh, adding into foods, sweet mix is a uh, sweetener enhancer. So it makes the taste of sugar or other sweeteners uh, bigger. It enhances it, uh, much like a microphone uh, it, you know, raises my voice. Yeah. Um, this, this sweetness enhancer raises or amplifies the taste of sweet. So I have one of our audience members, Denise, here. and She's been trying to cut out the sugar in her diet to get healthier. Thanks for being here, Denise. Thank you. So we're going to demonstrate with, together with you how this sweet mix works. So normally your taste buds get turned on by things mm -hmm. all the time. And then, you know, they're all there. And then they're not always turned on. They're supposed to be at rest waiting for something fun to happen, like mm, sugar. Like sugar. So put some sugar on your tongue. What do you like for sugar, by the way? What do I like with sugar? Yeah. Oh, cereal. All the good stuff. Candy. Right. See, sugar and candy gets on there, and you'll light up some of the taste buds. And they'll be really happy because they got the mm -hmm. sugar. And then after a while, those taste buds will get calm. We all yes. know that. We have the sugar. It passes from our system. We deal with the craving, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what happens if you take some sugar. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I take some sweet mix. Now, let's put it on together. Now watch what happens. It turns Ooh, on it's a party. all kinds of, it turns apart, it makes it into a party. And it's agitating and stimulating, and irritating, and it sounds good, but it amps up your reaction to sweetness so much that it goes haywire. Makes your tongue super sensitive to sweet taste, much more than you could ever have any control over. And frankly, because of that, you're completely now controlled by a food that you're putting in your mouth, not by your own decisions. So how does it make you feel when you realize you, we could be tricking your taste buds in a way you don't appreciate? Well, I'm already a huge sweet tooth, so it makes me angry that the food industry, when I'm trying to cut back on sugar, is, is enticing me to eat more and more and more and more and more sugar. Do you think sweet mix is safe? 
I don't think we really know. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of testing, certainly not a lot of public testing that's uh, available. Uh, the company, the biotech company that makes Sweet Mix, uh, sort of did its own testing and declared the product as safe, or grass, which is a uh, word that means, uh, the FDA means generally recognized as safe. But uh, it's a lot like the fox guarding the hen house. How do we truly know it's safe? So I want to hear from the audience. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. About your thoughts on this. Give us a new chemical sweetener. What goes through your head when you hear about these things? Who wants to talk about this? Here, go ahead. Take both of you. You can, you can stand if you want. <laughs> Um, absolutely not. I, when, I, when I think about, you know, all the chemicals that go into your food regularly, you think about it, you know, if they are putting them in there when we don't even know, it just, it's frightening. You know, yeah. I'm worried for myself. And I think you should, because again, when an expert doesn't know what's in there, it's concerning to all of us. You, maybe you, could, you have a question or a thought. What, what frustrates you about the idea of having something that the food industry is not telling us much about, but more importantly, they're using to cover up the sugar issues? It makes me mad. I have three young children to think about, and it's my responsibility to protect them. Um, I want to know what's in my food, and I want to understand the ingredients on the ingredient list. Yeah. That's a good point. Bruce, given the, this is an important question, given the food industry's track record, do you think we're going to ever know if sweet mix is in our products to the, to the point that has just been made? Will they ever make it easy for us to identify if we're eating it? I honestly don't think so. Um, they want ingredients like this to be hidden. Uh, they don't want a whole lot of public scrutiny around them. So I think most likely we'll see sweet mix hidden under a, a generic umbrella category like artificial sweeteners or sweetness blend or artificial flavors. Uh, they just don't want it to, you know, the light of day to really shine on it. All right, so we've been disappointed with sugar so far. You've highlighted the sweet mix idea. Then let's move to the other big culprit in tricking our taste buds, which is fats. And you argue we're actually introducing franken fats into the food system. What are these? Well, Franken fats have been around for a while. They're basically industrialized fats, and and they are you know created in labs. Uh, they uh, mimic uh, naturally occurring fats, but the processing that they go through is just so extreme that our bodies barely recognize them. And, and why is it that the food industry would make fats in laboratories? Why would they even bother? Well, it's all about getting cheap ingredients, and then these fats um, also extend the shelf lives of, of processed foods. If they're usually naturally occurring fats, uh, they have shorter shelf lives. So it's really in the food industry's favor to use cheap fats that uh, have long shelf lives. And it must be alarming for the food industry to have people like you, who used to be on the inside, and then now you're on the outside working systematically to point out these problems. I mean, how do they react to you? Well, I don't think they like it. Uh, I, don't th like, I don't think they want to give as much of a public stage, though, so I don't think they address a lot of it or call us out too much in public. But certainly, uh, they use some you know, sort of behind-the-scene tactics to uh, you know, make us targets. Does it matter to them if you speak out about these practices? Oh, it does matter to them, and I, they do do things. But it's, uh, I think in their ideal world, we'll, we will just go away. But, you know, my father suffered from 20 years worth of gastrointestinal problems. My mom has diabetes. I mean, I think it's all, it's time that we start taking a stand. It's time that we speak up. It's time that we stop letting our food be dictated and things hidden from us in our foods. We need to make a difference. Thank you very much. I know it's a big risk to you personally to speak out about these issues. A lot of us are trying to do the right thing by being smarter about the foods we eat. I heard from some audience members saying the exact same thing that I'm so passionate about, you know, that often means, by the way, you gotta be quick on your toes, really nimble, and able to spot the tricks. So uh, to see if you can spot more food industry tricks, take my quiz on DrOz.com. We'll be right back. Coming up, is your weight defining who you are? A prisoner trapped in your own body. Meet two women, two extremes, yet the struggle is the same. Learn to break free from the chains of food and regain your control, next. It's a condition commonly missed by doctors. Is your thyroid the hidden reason why you're tired, irritable, and gaining weight? The quick checklist to see if it's the culprit. All new odds. That's coming up tomorrow. Today, a very special truth to you. You're about to meet two women who have come to the show for life-saving help. One woman, cannot control what she eats. One woman finds control by not eating. Lori is 608 pounds. 
Lindsay is 87 pounds. Now from the outside, they look like polar opposites, but on the inside, physically and emotionally, they are more similar than they appear. I usually avoid mirrors, but whenever I do see myself in a mirror, I, I don't think that's me. I just think it's like a suit I'm wearing. Like I, I love life, I love my life, I just don't love this at all. I don't like to look in the mirror because when I look in the mirror, I don't want to see myself because I see a skeleton. I mean, I, I don't look healthy. Ever since I can remember, I always had a problem with my weight. In kindergarten, I was taller than all the kids, bigger than all the kids. Kids made fun of me all the time at school. Like, hey, fatty, you know. In seventh grade, they weighed me on the scale in the cafeteria because the regular scale only went up to 300. I actually felt like cattle. I went to the bathroom and started crying. Growing up, I had no problems with my weight, but in sixth grade, I was given a cholesterol test that the entire school took. The nurse called me up in front of the class, and she warned me and said, Lindsay, your cholesterol's a little high. And previously, I was very preoccupied with death because I'd had a lot of death in my family. And so with all of that, and then knowing I have high cholesterol or whatever else is going on inside of me that I wasn't really sure, um, I got kind of scared. At that point, I became obsessed with being healthy and avoiding death at all costs. And as I was becoming more aware of, of my diet, my weight started to decline. At 34 years old, I do feel like a prisoner in my own body. And my, my highest weight, I hit about 700 pounds. At one point, I, I got down to 70 pounds. In my quest to be healthy, I was actually killing myself. When I wake up, I, it's really hard to get out of bed. It hurts to even stand up. <laughs> Whenever I brush my teeth, I have to bend over the sink. The longest I can stand is probably about two minutes. I always have to sit in my chair because my, uh, my knees will give out if I stand up for too long. Because I'm so thin, in summer, I literally freeze. And in the winter, I dread it because I don't have enough fat on my body to keep me warm. When I lie in bed at night, my heart will sometimes start racing. Yeah, I hardly ever leave the house and I rarely even leave my room some days. Whenever I feel depressed, sometimes go in my car, go to a fast food place and go get ice cream. Or, or I'll just grab something and bring it to my room and just kind of like lay there and eat. Men don't want to see a woman that is emaciated. I, I don't feel attractive. My arms are veiny and bony and my bones stick out. My weight stopped me from doing a lot of things. It stopped me from getting the kind of jobs I want. Since my weight got so low, I stopped having a period. I've almost had to forget the option of having children because I doubt I'll be able to have them if I wanted them. It's something that just kills me on the inside. I do want a child of my own. And I don't know necessarily if it's a weight or not, but I just can't have one. My biggest fear is dying because of my weight. I mean, really, I, I can die any minute, actually. I feel shaky at times and I live alone. What if I stop breathing? What if my heart stops? Who's there to save me? It's time for me to stop having a food control me. My biggest fear is dying. I want to live as long as I can. I love life and I'm trying, but it's not working. I, I, don't, I don't like myself. I hate myself. <laughs> I cannot stand being like this anymore. Please welcome Lori and Lindsay. Hi. Lori, it's very good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Lindsay, how are you? 
Hold on, I gotta sit down. <laughs> yeah, please don't have a seat, of course. Oh. You have trouble walking? Oh yeah, I'm traveling here, it's horrible. <laughs> I'm sure it was tough. Where are you from? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. So, since you made all this trip, Lori, meet Lindsay. First time you're meeting. Hi. Lindsay, meet Lori. You heard each other's stories. What resonated to each of you? It's like embarrassment and just not being able to do anything and do what you want. Being afraid of dying. Yeah. Um, just like not knowing if your heart's going to stop. I mean, for different reasons. There are some similarities. We'll talk about them. And there's some differences. Mm -hmm. So as I heard your stories, what I took away from it were moments early in your life that shamed you, scarred you. Or you talked about the fact that you were pulled up in front of the school in, a, in the cafeteria and weighed. And yeah. Lindsay, you mentioned being in front of the class because your cholesterol was high. When you think back to those moments, Lori, we'll start with you. Describe what that, what, what was the emotion? Just that, embarrassment. It like, it, I just felt like cattle. I mean, really. Watching the cafeteria worker's face, just like the shock and awe, just, I couldn't stand it. I didn't want to be there. And Lindsay, how about you? When you think back to when you were pulled in front of the class for your cholesterol, I panicked, I was afraid. I, I had, I've experienced a lot of traumatic deaths in my life and um, saw some people die in front of me. And so when I heard that I had high cholesterol, I immediately thought, okay, I've gotta do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen to me. How can I prevent that? And that's when I became so obsessed with everything I put in my mouth. I can't just go and sit and eat a meal. Yeah. I mean, I have to analyze, is this, going to prevent cancer, or, you know, stop heart disease, or is this going to cause it? And it's like I can't eat just a fast food meal because I'm worried what, as it goes down my arteries, is it clogging them or is it, I hear know, you. I hear you. making I, my liver fatty? Are you able to join me in the truth tube? Okay. I know it's, a, it's never really a comfortable walk because <laughs> people never want to face these numbers. You can stand right here if you don't okay. mind, Lori. And you can stand right there. Lindsay, you can get up next to her. So... You're obviously similar in ways that you've begun to observe in each other. You mentioned the heart, but frankly, I could give you all kinds of numbers about your insides. So instead, I want to take a little different tact. I'm going to draw a diagram of Lori. Put the diagram up here. I think you're on the opposite sides of the eating spectrum for a reason. Mm -hmm. You're overeating, Lindsay, you're undereating. Because if I look at this in overeating, and there's your circle of reality and what you think about the world, and there's undereating with Lindsay. Notice there's an overlap. And you know what's in that overlap? The right amount. <laughs> control. Not just the right amount, control. You're fulfilling your needs in life by controlling something that you think you can control, which is the food you're putting in your body. And this is the overlap that's coming to hurt both of us. So, Lindsay, I mean, how does the, the, the way you control your eating make you feel in control? I guess I really... Even though I am somewhat controlling it, I still feel out of control in a sense that I don't know if I'm really doing the right thing. And so it's just that constant fear of, I mean, I'm trying to control it, but in a sense... Do you have that insight that it I, doesn't really work? Yeah. Right. I, do, I don't know, because I feel like I constantly don't really know if this is good or bad or... Because it looks like it's controlling you to me. Yeah, that's what I mean. I feel out, like I, yeah. And Lori, how about you? How, do, how does eating soothe your pain? It just numbs it. It doesn't really soothe it. I mean, just every, I just want everything to go away and food just seems to do it. And it always has probably. Probably. Come to sit down, I'm making you uncomfortable <laughs> here. Okay, I'm sorry about it that. It hurts. <laughs> so here's the good news. You can absolutely control your fate. And Lisa, to your point, I've got lots of tips I can give you that will get you there pretty quickly. But both of you are prisoners right now. Yeah. Literally prisoners. Yeah. In Definitely your own feel bodies. Like it. Yeah. I relate to that. And inside of you is this wonderful person who's being suffocated. Inside of you is someone who just needs to break through. And a lot of it comes back to the fact that you're fighting for control. And it's not working. So I think that you have an opportunity here. And I think your opportunity may come with each other. I want to understand this better with you, but you have to first get that very deep understanding, appreciation in your hearts that if you can help each other, you'll help yourself the most. Are you willing to make a commitment to do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to take back the control that you ceded 
to these habits, to the obsessions, to the soothing that you've given away. I, I want my life back. Lindsay? Definitely. It's going to be uncomfortable. I'll be there with you. I'll be holding your hand, but I know you can do it. But you've got to take the first step with me. Fair? Fair. Right. When we come back, the plan to take control of your lives, to take back control of the food you've been putting in your bodies. We'll be right back. Coming up, letting calories control your life? Are you self-medicating with food? Whether you're overeating or undereating, learn to stop being powerless. Break the cycle today. The plan for everyone to regain their control from food is next. We're back with Lori and Lindsay who didn't know each other before today. At 87 pounds and 608 pounds, they both feel like they're prisoners in their own bodies. But today, we have a plan to help them. And anybody who has let their relationship with food get out of control. I asked Tindy McCarty, founder of Shades of Hope, the treatment centers that have joined us in the past to, to be with us today. She's counseled thousands of women who suffer from overeating and undereating. So when someone spins out of control, especially with their relationship with food, mm -hmm. how do you regain it? <clears throat> well, give up the illusion. See, they have an illusion of control. They don't have the control, uh, but it feels like that they do. You know, when you're in the, the uh, you know, like when I weighed almost 300 pounds, I felt like as long as I could have the food, I could be in charge. Uh, and so and then I have a daughter that almost died from anorexia. Wow. And so, uh, you know, it was basically the same disease. We just acted it out on different ends of the spectrum. But it's about control, because many of us feel like we can't control what's going on in our lives, but we can control what goes on between our two lips. Lori and Lindsay look so differently on the outside, yet you argue that deep inside, their problems stem from the same place. Now, why is that? Majority of people with eating disorders, they start with what we call the core pain. Something has happened, it's not to place blame or on anyone, <clears throat> but it's usually uh, something that has started early in our life. I heard that, you know, you had, you know, we're weighed in front of the, uh, well, they had to take you to the lunchroom. Yeah. That's humiliating. But see, <clears throat> you didn't get, you were already a young child at that time that was very overweight. So I believe you started way earlier than that shaming, you know, I mean, it had been going on all of your life. Yeah. So we've got a plan for you that Tim's going to walk us through for Lenny and Lori and everyone else's, you know, sort of seated control. The first step is to assess the level of control the food has on you, to really be concrete about it. Okay. Tenny? Well, what both of you have said is that one word, obsession. And so the common denominator with both eating disorder, with anorexia and compulsive overeating is anger. Underneath both of you, it doesn't even look like anger. It's more like rage. But, you know, Lindsay, you can look sweet, precious, and darling, you know, and that's what anorexics do. They put on a, you know, a facade of being everything's okay here. But underneath, there can be lots of anger, lots of rage. So that core pain has to be worked on. We have to go back and see where all of it started. Well, can, I, can, I, can I speak about this core pain for a second? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I guess I feel like even through this, that people are trying to tell certain ways that, you know, this is why you do this or that. And I understand you have a lot of knowledge, but I, I never have felt really necessarily anger. My main thing is fear. I, I do sense that maybe anger is not the right word, although I think it's not an inaccurate word. I'd be angry if I were you, that you're in this predicament. You're trying to do all the right things, and yet you don't feel like you're able to get there. It's frustrating. So if we understand that core pain that Tanya was just describing, and we understand that it's a control we have to reassert. The question is, you know, how do you reassign this process? How do you change the role that food plays in your life? And Tanya, this is your area of expertise. Well, the first thing, you have to get sober around the food. You have to get the food, the disordered eating in order. For you, the, you know, it's about <clears throat> feeding yourself appropriate on both ends of the scale you know, feeding yourself appropriate. And once you do that, and what we recommend, and you've heard this millions of times, to eat, uh, you know, every three or four, five, don't go over five hours without eating. So you get a, uh, you know, you get a plan. It's not a diet, it's a food plan that has to, we live on the rest of our lives. And then, so you eat at eight o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at noon, six in the evening, and maybe a snack at night. In between that, you go live your life. 
You go live your life. You do something. Uh, I would suspect that y'all both stay in the house a lot. Do you isolate? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the house all the time. Do you like to be alone? Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? I don't, I don't know. It's just, I don't, I have people laughing at me all the time. When do you, pr like when do you do most of your eating? Your compulsive eating? Uh, night. Mm -hmm. yeah. And who's there? No one. My husband works nights. I know. Most of the overeating is done in secret. This is a very secret disease. We're as sick as we are secret. So here's how I see it. Uh, I think you're addressing the pain you have in your, in your life. This, you're trying to soothe it using food instead of people. And people define our lives. You know, they're the ones that we can usually rely on to fill the gaps in when we struggle with you know, this craziness that happens inside of our minds, which for you know, a lot of people just paralyzes us. I'm asking you if you'll do this together. <laughs> what do you think? I definitely want to. Uh, I don't want to do anything. Just get it, get it off me. <laughs> I like the desperation, but I want the desperation to spill into right. a plan. I want you yeah. guys to look in each other's eyes and make a commitment. You're going to have to be there for each other, yeah. celebrate each other. As different as you are, you're pieces <laughs> of a puzzle that come together. Now, here's the thing. Shays of Hope and his group is kindly offering to take both of you in. To share in treatment, you would be roommates. Awesome. <laughs> now, it, it, I, I'm, if you'll accept, I got oh, yeah. two sets of tickets for you. Some tickets will take you back home. Other tickets will take you together to Shades of Hope. Which ticket do you want? I want to go. <laughs> I definitely want to go. Lindsay, you go today, right after the show. We have the tickets. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah. You want it badly enough to make that decision? I want to go. Yeah. But... All right. Yeah. They're all yours, Tina. Really? Take good so care. Excited. Take good care of my patients. Oh, all right. So we'll be right back. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Next, toss out those costly creams and products. Reverse the aging process with age-defying foods to tackle just about everything, from baggy eyes to sagging skin. Look and feel younger. Your seven-day anti-aging diet is next. It's a condition commonly missed by doctors. Is your thyroid the hidden reason why you're tired, irritable, and gaining weight? The quick checklist to see if it's the culprit. All new odds. That's coming up tomorrow. And before the show, I asked my studio audience to look at themselves in the mirror and write down their biggest aging complaint. There they are doing it all. And then I enlisted the help of top dermatologists and nutritionists on my advisory board, asking them what they do, what they eat to stop down aging. So we're taking their personal tips. Together we have created an anti-aging diet and in seven days, you can begin to see the results. Here with me is dermatologist Dr. Ellen Marmer, an anti-aging food researcher and registered dietitian, Christine Kirkpatrick. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Dr. Marmer, we'll start with you. What determines if a food has an anti-aging benefit or not? You know, we hear that thing, you are what you eat, and it's really true. It shows up in your skin if you're eating a healthy diet versus an unhealthy diet. Kristen, you, you've dedicated your life to these anti-aging foods. Why are you so passionate about this? So I'm passionate because food is really nature's skin cream. I've seen so many of my patients spend money on expensive creams and products, but if they're not fueling their skin the way they're fueling the rest of their organs, they're not going to get the results that they're looking for. All right, let's get started. We're going to talk about the most common issues. We're not getting any younger. So uh, before any more of these blotches and problems become issues, right. let's talk about redness. It's very common. Uh, is an image of a classic uh, individual with some redness on their face. So Kristen, why do we suffer from red skin? So redness happens to be one of the main culprits that we're seeing from this really lack of vitamins and minerals from a really bad diet. Now, come on, let's show everybody. Who, who thinks they have red skin here, by the way? Show of hands. I see red skin, I'm looking at it. <laughs> it's not just rouge on your faces. You know, people don't even <laughs> notice it on themselves and it sneaks up on you. And it's one of the things as physicians we look for we're trying to identify if they're allergic issues and nutritional issues, but you've got a tip for us that you think will help everybody. Yes, so pumpkin seeds, I think, are one of the best foods in the world for red skin. And the reason for that is that pumpkin seeds are high in a mineral called zinc. Now, for years, we've known that zinc has been in pimple medication that you put on your face. So if, if we can put some zinc into our body, we can probably see the same effects and get some of those benefits. And how many pumpkin seeds do we have to eat? Can we count them out? No, I, I bought a quarter of a cup. 
a few times a week will give you about 20% of the RDA. All right, so next, uh, let me see, we got uh, Bertina. Where's Bertina? This is her card. Coming up, join us, Bertina. She wrote down that her biggest complaint was dry skin. As you get closer, I see a little, come over in the middle here. So what part of your body do you have the dry skin on? My hands. I work in healthcare and I'm constantly washing my hands, all the time, washing my hands. Also, my forehead, in this area right here. Okay. Yeah. How often do you moisturize yourself? Um, twice a day. Okay. And despite that, does your skin look like this? Is that yeah, pretty my accurate? Hands, my hands. Your hands sometimes? Thanks for being the healthcare fan. This is a, the big takeaway here, and I'm just going to point out the example of what Kristen was pointing out. Okay. Yeah, so salmon's king when it comes to moisturizing. So we know that those omega-3 fatty acids, they help to smooth skin, to retain elasticity. We want to keep that elasticity. And anytime we have those fats, it really moisturizes everything from your hair. Okay. Um, we have studies that actually show that. So you have omega-3 fatty acids, get it in wild salmon, and you're going to moisturize from top to bottom. Okay. Put some of that salmon in the, in the nurse's lounge. Oh, right. Hide it in there. Oh, they'll love it. They'll, they'll love, love it, yeah. It. Yes, and you preserve it for yourself. <laughs> yeah, well. Thanks for being thank here. You, All right, we got another question here. It's from Dawn. Where's Dawn? Dr. Murmur's going to help with these. Come on over. Now, Dawn says she's got issues with wrinkles, according to this. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Where do you notice the wrinkles the most? I notice them under my eyes. I live in Florida, so I get a lot of sun. Uh, I notice them when I smile and they're not very funny. I also, want to, I also want to prevent wrinkles that I may inherit from my mom, that uh, dreaded turkey yes. dribble. Those mothers, they always do that to us. <laughs> and the only turkey I want is on my Thanksgiving table. <laughs> what, have you done, what have you tried to do for your wrinkles? I've tried everything. I think like, I've just tried every single cream. Mm -hmm. um, when I can remember, I do wear sunglasses. I find a lot of people resort to creams when they, they haven't done the, the, the deeper inner work first. And so you're actually just, you know, putting you know, a little bit of plaster on the outside without making the foundation strong. Dr. Marmer, what do you recommend? So next tip on the anti-aging diet. Well, the good news is that you really can um, reverse some of the damage that we've done. Um, one great food for us here is vitamin C. What's the richest source here? Um, the peppers are one of the best sources of vitamin C. Eight, eight strips of pepper are gonna give you 97% of your daily recommended um, dose. Um, so peppers are actually fruits. And um, as you see these other fruits, fruits here. They're fruits? They really are, they have seeds. Uh, so well, they're do. actually fruits. I'm so glad I came to work today. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. to be here too. To keep eating over here. <laughs> okay. All right, Very the good. last step in the anti-aging diet applies to an area that almost all of us suffer from. I happen to be a particular good example, so I'm gonna use my own little card. Great. Look at these little bags under my eyes. There I am, Aww. that's early in the morning. Aww. Early in the morning, folks. So why do we get puffy eyes? Why is it that I can't get rid of them? Okay, so Dr. Oz, thank you for volunteering to be our, our model today. Um, so what happens around the skin, around the eyes, is that that skin is thinner than the other skin. There's less dermis there. There's less collagen to begin with. And as we age and get some sun damage and even smile a lot, that skin stretches out and it loses a bit of elasticity. So we get those crinkles. And the eyelid kind of sinks down a little bit. How depressing. So it's so depressing. Is, is we get a, a little shadow there. Is there a good there. solution here? Yeah, so water, simple water, is one of the best things to remember to do. And so cucumbers, First of all, it tastes great, and they're great in your water to motivate you to drink it, but also they have a super high water content. They're one of the highest water content foods that we have. So cucumber water, eight glasses a day, stick them on your eyes. Like this? Yes, they look really good, right? What do you guys think? <laughs> Dr. Moore, thank you very much. Chris and Kirkpatrick, Perfect. thank you Perfect. as well. My full anti-aging shopping list is on DrOz.com, and I'll be right back. <laughs> What's your favorite anti-aging food? My favorite is cucumbers. Not only are they healthy and delicious, but I put slices of them in my eyes each evening. They keep my wrinkles at bay and don't cost much. Share yours on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. Next, if you think there's nothing you can do to fight cellulite, think again. Secret tips to help you fight this nagging beauty problem that almost all women face. From simple solutions to cutting edge treatments, there's a cellulite prescription right for you. Next. of you may have it and not a single one of you wants it. I'm talking about cellulite. And today I'm helping you reduce its appearance with my cellulite prescription. I've got a very brave volunteer to start us off. Stacy, come join me. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, it took a lot for Stacy <laughs> to come out and talk about something that almost all of us have an issue with. Yes. So describe your cellulite. What does it look like to you? It looks like little 
bubble fat things just kind of hanging around there. I hate going to the beach with bikinis. I always wear a wrap on it. I want to cover it up. I never wear shorts ever, ever, ever. If I do, they're down to here to cover it. I well, just. Well, thank never. you for revealing yours today. You're welcome. <laughs> now, do you sometimes think it looks like this? Yes. I think it looks worse than that at times. Yes. How about that? Yes, cottage cheese for sure. Cottage cheese. <laughs> All right, let's get started. The first step on the Sally prescription comes from the stylist. We didn't think that's the trace, but it's absolutely true. We've got a world-class stylist here, Denise Caldwell, and you're gonna walk me through this. Gosh. What is the most common mistake women make that's actually causing them to have more visible cellulite? You know what? Ladies are getting it wrong with the underwear. It's this, elastic is your enemy. Mm. Let me ask you a personal question. Does your underwear look like this a little bit? Are you getting fresh with me? No, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just a <laughs> medical show. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> some of it does, yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I also have some that looks like this, though, as well. Okay. So, so before we get to the, to the solution, what is this? Why is the elastic a problem? You know what? Elastic, actually, it cuts off your circulation. Not to mention, it gives you this ugly panty line when you're mm -hmm. wearing it. So you had a solution for us. I've never heard of it before, but I guess you have because you say you have some of these. What's, <laughs> what is special about this pair of underwear? Absolutely. The key thing here when you're thinking about underwear, in a perfect world, we want to go commando. That means no undies mm -hmm. at all or if you venture out with a thong, but I actually brought a perfectly fitting brief. And what I like about it is, is that it has nylon and it has spandex in it. When you're thinking about underwear, try to stay away from the cotton because when you have softer materials, it lays smoothie on there and there's no elastic here, baby. You know what I, I mean? I love that. Yeah. Well, we were curious about this, so we decided to actually do a little test. I wanna show you a picture of a woman's cellulite when she's wearing the elastic underwear, the first that we showed. Okay, now here's the seamless underwear you see, mm. it lifts it up, it gives you a smoother derriere, and even looks like some of the cellulite is gone, which is great. Yeah. It will save your life. Change your underwear style, change your life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you very much. Exactly. All right, the next step in our cellulite prescription is from the dermatologist, Dr. Janine Downey is here, and she has personal experience, she admits, with cellulite. May I show this picture? Yes, you can. So here's the picture. Thank mm -hmm. you for showing this. Mm -hmm. So that's my thigh. So I can't believe I'm showing this. It's not an X-rated area. It's what you'd see if I was in a bathing suit. So what would you do? What, what do you do for that yourself? What do you recommend to your patients? Um, I tell them diet. I tell them exercise. And I tell them there's a simple combination of this coffee sugar scrub that works very, very well. The coffee actually kind of stimulates the fat cell breakdown and the sugar helps to brighten and exfoliate. And then you mix it so it's like two cups of coffee, uh -huh. one cup of sugar, and then like three quarters of a cup of water. It's like making a brownie. Yeah, except a <laughs> coffee-laden brownie. Okay. I like brownie brownies. Um, and then what you do is you just grab a little of this and you just like put it on kind of as a scrub. I and love scrub home it. remedies. Yeah, and so that's that's basically all it is. And a lot of women will use it on their upper arms. They'll use it on their Thank derriere. You. They use it on their thighs. You know, on the cellulite prone areas. Yeah. All right, let's go. Keep going. Thank you okay. very much. Thank as you. Dr. Thank Downey. you. Bye bye. The next step in the cellulite prescription is from the plastic surgeon, Dr. Haida Hermond is here. So what's the newest treatment that you got in store for us? Yes, so Dr. Oz, as a plastic surgeon, I'm always looking for effective treatments. And the newest cellulite treatment that I'm really excited about is Body FX. Mm. It's a completely non invasive radio frequency treatment that uses suction that delivers a threefold attack on cellulite. Ooh. What's well, the moment you've been waiting for? If yes. you want, you are appropriately dressed. Would you like to give it a shot? I would love to. Perfect. I'm, I'm very excited about this. I did not know much about the doctor. We're going to put you up on the table, Stacey. Can I slip these off? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Please do. And while Stacey's getting ready, why don't you explain to us exactly how it works? Sure. So the way it works is threefold. Number one, the suction. Number two is a radio frequency pulse. Number three is the heat itself, heating the skin. Take it away, Doc. I'm excited. Okay, great. So I'm going to put it on and I'm going to apply. You're going to feel a little bit of suction. How uh -huh. does it feel for you? It feels like a warm suction. And it gives the pulse. Yeah. That was it? That's it. You basically take about 10 minutes per area, this size area. So an average treatment takes about 20 to 30 minutes for both sides. So you can go right back to work if you do it at lunch. Absolutely. You can I go back that. to work. Um, I recommend typically um, eight, six to eight treatments for a okay. whole series to really see an improvement. So we actually have some pictures of one of Dr. Herman's patients before and after the radio frequency treatment. Isn't that pretty cool, Stacey? That's kind of amazing. So how much does so, it cost? I'm that's sorry. what I was just yeah. gonna ask. <laughs> so it depends on the location where you're at, but it can start at about 100 to 200 per treatment. And as I mentioned, I recommend about six to eight treatments. Okay. It's like a dollar a dimple. 
It's worth Seriously, it. Seriously, yeah, I would do that. <laughs> well, honestly, though, the results of this particular thing do last. It can, it can last for months. And I do recommend if you want to maintain a smoother look, do a touch-up every six months, every four to six months. You think you might try this, Stacey? I absolutely think I'm going to try this. We have a happy customer. Thank yes, you very much. Thank you. you. You can find lots more at home satellite soon. This is DrOz.com. We'll be right back. Tell us, what's the biggest cellulite myth you've heard? I'm a fitness trainer, and almost all of my clients think that cellulite only happens to out-of-shape people. Not true. It can happen to almost anyone. Share yours on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. All new Dr. Oz. It's a condition commonly missed by doctors. Is your thyroid the hidden reason why you're tired, irritable, and gaining weight? The quick checklist to see if it's the culprit. Plus... I'm really excited to see my father save a life. Oz takes his daughter to work. Joy, come over here for a second. This is really nerve-wracking. The shocking moment you've got to see. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. Now it's time for In Case You Missed It. First, a food industry whistleblower was here today to warn you about the most worrisome threats in your food. Now, while there's one threat you should all know about, it's a sweetener. And you should look out for it. It's called Sweet Mix. It's made in a lab to be a sweetness enhancer. And it works by making your tongue super sensitive to the sweet sensation. But be wary of the label. Artificial sweeteners, you hear that word, artificial sweeteners or artificial flavors or sweet blend, they're never going to write the other sweet mix probably on the label. You'll know that it's potentially with that. Next, I gave you my anti-aging plan. So if you suffer from red or blotchy skin, which is so common out there, you can try pumpkin seeds. A quarter cup of pumpkin seeds contains zinc that may also help decrease the inflammation inside of your body. And there's one more thing. I love acknowledging the people who are important to me in my life and who have made me who I am today. And one of those people that I really adore my roommate, my best friend, Scott Foreman. Here's a picture of us from the good old days. And here's a picture of him now. In fact, forget the picture. Here he is in person. Now, he doesn't know I'm doing this. Didn't expect it, did you, Scott Foreman? <laughs> it is impossible to keep him speechless. Impossible. I think this is my one chance. His nickname, by the way, and his email is Dr. Sunshine, because he always brings joy to everyone's life, including Margie, his wife, who's still with him all, after all these years. And I said earlier, there are people in our lives define who we are. So I want you to tell everybody what you thank me for. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you Dr. Sunshine? Well, I, I thank you for uh, pushing me out of my comfortable zone. You know, when your mammoth's friend, he, he comes up to you and said, so Scott, what are you doing to change the world? And it's like, I'm trying to be a good dad. Is that okay? It's more than enough. You're a good guy. And I love being with you. Thanks for being here. Finally, I'm going to close the warning. Please be careful about what you buy online, especially weight loss pills. Dubious people online make it seem like I'm endorsing their products. I don't. To see a full list of our trusted sponsorship partners, please go to DrOz.com, and I will see you all next time. Woo!